Great, thank thank you so much. Sorry, it's always clunky. I think to start a, a virtual session, I, I really wish I could see all of you who are in the virtual room uh, today, so that this could be more of a discussion rather than a presentation. As as was mentioned, my name is Alana Golbin. I'm the responsible AI leader for PwC globally. This is something that I've been working, a space that I've been working in for about seven or eight years now. Um, I'm I'm honored to be joining you all today. I am a practicing data scientist. I have been for um, basically my entire professional career and really over the last seven years, as I mentioned, the topic of how we, uh, the topics I should say surrounding how we appropriately build and govern AI systems has become more and more important. Um, our, the, the, my start to this journey was much more technical. Uh, about seven or eight years ago, that's where we were thinking about very specific questions around, um, are there certain techniques to provide appropriate explanations for AI systems? How do we start to think about how we would ultimately assess systems for bias or test for the robustness? Uh, over time, it's emerged that governance is really this overarching umbrella that um, uh, I would say underpins all of the requirements that we have to in, uh, put into practice within organizations in order to design the appropriate testing methodologies as well as to align on uh, organizational wide goals for what we even mean by the appropriate use of AI machine learning and importantly the data that it serves as well as the insights that they generate. So the purpose of this talk today is, is really an attempt to begin to bridge this gap. Uh, this is an evolving space. The, uh, the techniques and the strategies that work for some organizations don't necessarily work for all. And this is an area that I think collectively, um, as there's more and more regulatory pressure, we're starting to think about how to engage and evolve in that space more effectively. So I'll go through a few different um, topics here, but importantly, I think the, the genesis of this talk and why I wanted to give it is that I think there are two primary approaches that seem to be emerging within, within organizations, and they both have their own pros and cons, and, and I wanted to talk through those with you all today. So uh, before I even get into that, um, I, I just wanted to level set on what governance is. Mostly because when you say governance to a room of especially technical people, we start to cringe like, oh my God, there's going to be a ton of compliance requirements and there's a, just a ton of burdensome um, oversight, a lot of hurdles unnecessarily in place. Uh, and I, I don't actually think this is the purpose of governance. Uh, that might be what it looks like for certain types of practices within organizations. That's more an artifact of um, how things have historically been done rather than how they should be done. Uh, to do governance effectively is really to be implementing a repeatable, as we say on the left-hand side here, repeatable set of processes and procedures that enable organizations to manage the risks, harms, and benefits of AI systems. Note that we say the benefits of AI systems in this definition. I firmly believe that an effective governance program is centered around being able to identify opportunities of AI systems, um, as well as the potential uh, harms and risks attached and come to in, an informed decision about that is repeatable and reproducible across an organization about what we should and should not be building, where we institute garden rails and where we should be adopting new types of practices. Um, my observation in working in this space for, for some time is that a lot of conversations and a lot of decisions that might be made about um, what we should and should not be doing is almost a ad hoc process. Uh, there's no formalized uh, mechanism to, to, to perform these types of decisions repeatedly. Um, there seems to be this like, no one wants to say yes, but no one wants to say no type of a problem. So it escalates up chains, back down chains, to go back up chains. It's very, very frustrating. And so an effective governance model is really there to uh, enable this type of a repeatable process that, there, uh, that we can engender confidence in that we're effectively mitigating risk while maximizing benefits. Um, so again, governance is not there to provide hurdles. It's there to streamline. It's there to provide common practice. It's there to, it should be there to figure out how we can maximize potential while thinking about how we might mitigate some of those risks. Um, so again, just some, some principles to keep in mind here when we think about what a good governance program is. It needs to be repeatable. It needs to be justifiable. So there needs to be a record um, and we need to be able to support that record. And ultimately it should be promoting good practice across an organization. So that's generally what uh, our perspective is on the framing of AI governance. Um, now I've, I've mentioned a, a little bit that 
there are a few different approaches to designing um, uh, AI governance practices, and they really kind of come from this top-down and, and bottom-up type of an approach. Uh, a top-down governance strategy focuses on designing policies and strategies and then enforcing practices down from there based on that high level view meaning this is something that's agreed upon at an incredibly high level over the organization might require a fair bit of alignment and then the hope is that it propagates down effectively into a way that people actually understand uh, the other approach is more of a grassroots effort starting from technology and practice um, now this is interesting in its own right because uh, if anybody's been monitoring the space of AI governance and, and responsible AI for the last five to ten years, um, especially over the last three to five years, there's just been a litany of products as well as open source frameworks and toolkits and uh, testing methodologies and what have you that have emerged um, that as first line teams or us building AI systems might adopt uh, in the pursuit of having more repeatable process and alleviating the risks and harms uh, attached to AI systems. So both of these different perspectives exist. An effective governance model really should do both at the same time or at least align somewhere in the middle. This doesn't always happen. So uh, let's kind of go a little bit deeper into, uh, into what those look like. But before we do that, I, I wanted to align and take a step back on why we even do governance. Um, the, the remit of governance is to institute responsible practices from the beginning of the conception of a specific application to how you define how the data will be used and ultimately how it's implemented, deployed, and monitored. Uh, the perspective around responsible AI, is, as, as I see it, is that it really starts from having a set of strategies around what good looks like for an organization what, believe, what we believe we should or should not be doing, not just what we can or cannot do based on regulatory um, uh, requirements and other types of, of uh, um, uh, restrictions. Governance is the mechanism to implement that by considering the responsible practices that we wanna be upholding. That's what we have in the middle here. That's like those questions around interpretability and explainability. Um, who do you have to explain this system to? Why do you have to explain it? What constitutes a good explanation? Um, from a bias and fairness perspective, uh, how do we measure for bias and fairness? Who are we evaluating the system against for fairness? Um, how do we really implement practices that um, promote equity and mitigate potential discrimination? Uh, what does that look like in the usage of a system as well as in the design and the development of it? Uh, privacy, safety, security, and so on. All of these come with their own requirements which are really specific to individual applications. Governance is here to keep that all organized and again, make it clear to understand when one type of principle or practice needs to be more, um, uh, um, not important, but a higher priority for a specific system versus others because they might not all be equally um, uh, possible or implementable. And I, I think the, the, the thing that I really wanna leave this slide with is that I don't think any governance model is effective without having a basic alignment on what good model development even looks like. Um, especially over the last few years with the big push for democratization of machine learning, uh, it, it's been very hard for many organizations to have consistent practices with consistent stage gates, with consistent checkpoints um, around their, their model development processes so that everybody's building and aligning the same way. So we'll, we'll go and, and break down some of these as, as we go. So now thinking about this question about starting with, with strategy, what, what does that even mean? Um, so I walked through those different dimensions. We talked about how the strategy led or top down type of an approach to responsible AI uh, means starting at a high level and going down um, a little bit further from there. So in this case, um, if we take a situation where a company is developing some type of a hiring tool um, and it would be using video interviews and chatbots and other other types of candidate information um, in this case say that the company or the leaders of a specific business unit say that transparency in this particular situation uh, for these classes of systems uh, are going to be very 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 important um, so we need to be enabling transparency that is a principle so to us as developers we have to ultimately know what what does that mean what how do i actually do that. It's it's very nice to say that I have to have an explainable system, but there are many different ways I can implement it. I could use a variety of open source toolkits. Um, maybe I have to rethink my model design in general. 
who has to be evaluating this? Do we have a sense of what, what information they need in order to build that confidence with the system? Uh, so this is really where, where we're starting to decompose what, principle, what the principle of transparency means. Um, now, that gets then implemented through control practices by instituting new processes and oversight throughout the different development um, stage gates of a specific application with a policy around AI use, which dictates um, who has to review a system. And conceivably, as they're reviewing that, they will be thinking about the users and they would be considering this principle as part of that review. Um, when we consider the responsible practices, what are those specific goals that the, the leaders that are evaluating the system want to uphold? Um, and then ultimately, how do they align on what good would look like from an interpretability and explainability perspective? We're really just trying to get to a point of saying, we have this abstract thing, and here is how we can help you figure out what that means in practice and bridging that gap. Um, so that's starting from strategy or from that policy lens, top down, going all the way down to practices. Um, trickle down, uh, and you might imagine that there are probably several challenges to implementing that throughout the way. Uh, we have to have effective processes. You have to, the processes have to be designed with uh, a view of what model development actually looks like for these types of systems. They need to be tangible. Um, they might need to consider uh, vendors if any any type of tool in this type of a, a, um, an application doesn't actually originate from the company. Um, I'll say that this is actually, in some sense, a very real scenario. Uh, there is a, a law that is going into effect in New York City on January 1st, which requires companies to undergo a bias audit of all automated employment decision tools, which is broader than AI, I should say. Um, and they're going through the same type of a thing. There was a principle around fairness and now we need to think about how do you measure for that? Um, how do we put those um, control mechanisms in place? What does who who can perform the assessment? What does an effective assessment look like? Um, what type of uh, recommendations need to come out of that type of an analysis? Who needs to approve it? When do they look at it? Uh, and then ultimately, how do we then take information from that test to improve that system, which is the goal of um, of this? So that's starting from a strategy led perspective. If we go to a practice-led perspective, this is the opposite example, um, where instead of having an organization that comes to consensus that there's some type of a principle that's super important, um, a, some organizations are also seeing that their um, individual teams are, are in, with the best of intentions trying to adopt practices and align on expectations amongst themselves without a directive from the top uh, to institute good practice. In this case, um, perhaps the same, the data scientists that are working on this automated hiring tool um, are noticing in their testing that there is something funky happening with specific groups. Maybe a certain model in this tool doesn't seem to work equally well or produces somewhat spurious outcomes uh, when testing against a subset of, of the population, which you know, good practice is to do fairly extensive testing on applications before we launch them. Not always do we think about subsetting the population into different segments and then testing it against that. So uh, this would be an example of an organization or a group that was taking this upon themselves. So again, starting from core practice, it's good model development practice to be stress testing and thinking about uh, different failure points. Um, they're aggregating that information into a bias analysis because ultimately they're they're appreciating that this disparate uh, performance uh, is is driven or potentially driven based on demographic information. Um, and they through the responsible practices layer, we can think of why why is that occurring? And maybe this is because we don't have good balance across the data set. We don't have equal representation across these different groups and that's going to impact our performance. Um, so then that might be an analysis that a team inherently just does, starts doing, um, which is good, but what happens when multiple teams have different perspectives on what bias means, but they're all working on hiring tools. Um, so this is a potential friction, even though it is grassroots and led. Um, the organization might then take this and say, we're doing these types of bias analyses, let's try and institutionalize that uh, through policies and ultimately by aligning on fairness definitions or perspectives around fairness, or even just saying that fairness is a, a priority principle and we'll be evaluating it for these specific types of systems. So 
starting from practice led and trying to, to escalate up through that same type of um, uh, 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 the, sta the stages or segments of, of responsible AI. Uh, so this all is great. It works really nicely in that dummy example. Maybe there are some potential shortcomings. Maybe there are some things that could be uh, going better, going worse. Uh, let's kind of dive into each of those uh, in a little bit greater detail and then take a step back and think about how we can put this into practice uh, more effectively. So one of the, the challenges that organizations are starting to face is who bears the responsibility for AI governance within an organization. Uh, to some degree, this is whoever is interested uh, because there are a lot of, thankfully, interested parties in this space. Um, some organizations might have a natural owner. Uh, banks have a historical function called model risk management. This is a, an organization that, because of regulations, has been put into place to evaluate regulated um, actuarial and statistical models for things like credit and, and underwriting. So model risk management has historically looked at a fairly few slices of, of types of models maybe taking a more expanded role to look at all AIML and scope in much more into their, um, into their effective governance. Um, marketing models, chatbots, you know, video, video screening tools, if we're thinking about our past example. Um, all of that is not historically something that MRM, model risk management, would spend a whole lot of time on, uh, but now might, might have a lot more interest. Another angle where we're seeing um, governance structure is really starting to, to drive is in the space of privacy. Uh, there is many organizations have a chief privacy officer or some kind of a privacy leader. Um, there, there might be a privacy council. There are tons of privacy laws. Um, some, many already on the books, many definitely emerging. And the reason why privacy is interested in this is, is multiple. One, they're already overseeing data and it's not a pretty big leap to say um, what is a permissible to use data for, what do we want to be using data for, which is more of the data ethics lens, um, and then ultimately what we're building with that data. So that very quickly goes into AI ML. So that's one reason. Another reason is that some privacy laws in general are starting to incorporate um, specific provisions around AI systems. And that in its own right is, is uh, important for the privacy office to be aware of, to think about that intersection. Um, and then also there are just some leading organizations that have organized a lot of their compliance functions under the privacy office so that everything um, rolls up into that space. And that's a, a, a unique perspective, but it's something that is, is starting to take a little bit more of a foothold. Um, other areas where we see uh, interest in, in AI oversight, um, IT governance or quality assurance types of groups, these are like really traditional um, scrum agile type of oversight teams, uh, not necessarily have um, a lot of experience evaluating for uh, a whole host of regulatory compliance, uh, but definitely close to the engineering side of model development, um, especially over the last few years as model ops is starting to take hold. So that's a space where we see some oversight. And then data and analytics teams themselves, these are typically business functions or groups that support the business, not often in a compliance type of a role, but there is a, a big push in some analytics teams to provide more of a self-governance so that no other team who probably doesn't know as much from a technical perspective um, needs to be involved. There, you know, all of these different groups definitely have their own strengths, um, but effectively what what a, um, an oversight committee or structure needs to have is a mix of an understanding of business requirements, what types of systems are, are, are being built, um, why, uh, what type of benefit they'll have. They need to understand the actual technical domains to some degree. Uh, you need to know enough about how models are built and sustained in order to govern them effectively. Otherwise, we run the risk of instituting practices that are not implementable, and, and we see this all the time. Um, and then also, they need to have enough of the, the traditional software engineering space as well, so that we can think about scale. Um, again, with the intent of not providing extremely cumbersome practices that really um, restrict the development and might potentially tank uh, a governance program from the get-go. Um, 
the structure that these committees might take or these groups might take, they could be specific to one particular group, they could be federated across the whole organization, but ultimately um, we're, we're seeing like one type of a leader emerge that's supported by um, a, a multifunctional type of a committee or a multifunctional type of, of discipline, group of disciplines, which define initial set of practices, which then can hopefully be more self-sustaining going forward. And it, it really is important that we, we remember that building governance models appropriately and implementing governance models appropriately really doesn't actually fall on one group. Um, it, it, there are responsibilities that will, will be burdened to everybody. Understanding what, what um, the role of a specific, um, organ, a specific unit within the organization should be responsible for versus another uh, is a good way to split work up as well and then realign on expectations. Uh, so again, this top-down approach would really start from an enterprise view of responsibilities, which would then kind of drop down to the second line of defense um, uh, perspective, uh, where leadership is determining priorities, legal and privacy and compliance are, are commenting on additional requirements and helping to draft policies, um, and you might have in, independent review groups or some kind of an independent, um, independent team who's there to check and challenge the development. First line of defense that's us as model builders, people who are hands-on coding, building models, also potentially commission, commissioning models or buying models and uh, aligning on specific requirements that we might want to take along the way. Uh, a few other structures that we see sometimes emerging, sometimes not. Um, some organizations have adopted an external uh, um, ethics review board. I think there have been multiple examples of those being both impactful as well as not impactful really comes down to emboldening that organization and empowering them to make um, to make decisions or, or uh, um, to provide feedback to the organization that organization will meaningfully adopt. If they don't do that, then kind of what's the point of having an ethics review uh, review board? And, and there are some interesting examples of um, extremely public situations where uh, the the perspective that was provided by the ethics review committee was not. Um, not taken into account, not put into practice, and there was significant pushback. So this type of a three lines of defense model is um, common to people who work in a compliance space. It might be newer for those of us not coming from that type of a world, but splitting up roles and responsibilities across these three lines makes it very clear on um, when specific teams need to intersect with one another and where, uh, where teams can kind of operate independently from one another as well. Clarifying that is also part of a top-down um, top process because there are many more organizations or internal to a larger company than what we have uh, listed here on this page. And um, responsible AI is also not just one point in time. Hey, I built this thing. I want to hit the publish button. Um, who do I need the giant stamp of approval from? It really culminates from all different phases of instituting a whole program around AI to facilitating who, who will be running it and how we'll be running it, what technology we'll use, uh, which, which types of vendors, what training we accomplish, and then ultimately the process of building, implementing, and deploying a model and monitoring it. Um, it, we really need to have an effective governance framework that considers all of that. Uh, not easy to do all at once, definitely takes time to build, uh, is certainly possible, uh, and definitely can be achieved through a fairly iterative, um, iterative model of development. Um, one thing I will say is that there are different teams that tend to be involved at different phases throughout this. Uh, the strategy side will be driven more by leadership because it's something that has to be cross-organization. Um, they'll kick off this planning and ecosystem one, but that will likely be taken by a, by a more of like a middle management uh, level of the organization. Um, the nine-step process here, which is the iterative model development lifecycle, is um, usually driven entirely by the first line. We're, we're building systems, but we have to align to what expectations are on the business side, who's going to be using it, what does good look like? Um, do we have success criteria? And so on and so forth. We'll talk a little bit more about this one later. Um, and one other thing I'll say about the nine step process is that um, we sometimes think of model development as a fairly linear process, but it is highly iterative. And a governance model needs to take that into account. 
uh, we will change our mind based on the data that we see and the feedback that we get from users. Um, and unlike traditional software, you can't just like add a new feature to an ML model. It, you have to redo the whole thing. Um, and that, that requires considerations throughout this application level type of an assessment. This uh, last phase here, uh, monitor and report, is really oriented around um, how we observe the effectiveness of a model over a long period of time and then provide compliance as to its continued performance. So that's a fairly meat and potatoes thing for a governance um, structure to think about is, is the stuff that we're building actually working properly um, and can we, can we report on that appropriately? It just needs to be done in a slightly different way for AI systems than it might be done for other systems. Um, it, there, there are a bunch of examples of top-down governance mechanisms, um, and not just within specific organizations, but also um, obviously those that are driven by governments or by um, multinational types of entities or even um, consortia and other working groups. Obviously, those are going to be top-down because they don't have individual systems to work with. They might engage data scientists. Uh, many of them, in fact, do or they attempt to, but um, policy really gets to a point of providing uh, the, the goalposts. What are we trying to get to and how do we think we can potentially get there? And so they're typically very principles based where they'll say things like privacy is really important, explainability is important. Um, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, mitigating discrimination is important. Those are all principles. Uh, could be implemented in different ways. There might be different considerations, but they they ultimately are out outlining those goalposts. We want to get to a point where things are explainable, where they are transparent, where they are fair, so on and so forth. Um, the U.S. Blueprint for an AI Bill of Rights, which I have linked on the right-hand side here, is a great example of a policy document. It, it's it's very long, I think it's like 70 pages, uh, but it is a collation of a lot of existing materials that the government has, um, the US government, I should say, has uh, collated around what what their perspectives are from uh, the, 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 pers the position of regulating AI systems. Um, it outlines a set of principles, which are largely similar to the ones that you have before with some, some interesting differences because of the unique lens here. Uh, and it outlines a potential pathway forward for um, implementing some of these practices, which it, it promotes. So if you're looking for a good example of a policy, that is a good example of a policy. Policies inside organizations are typically smaller, but they do still have principles. They still will have a perspective around um, do's and don'ts, go, no-go areas. Um, they might provide guidance on where to seek additional information if something is not very well defined. Uh, they might provide a taxonomy or a set of definitions that makes it easier to interpret the policy. Uh, one of the, the types of definitions that I've seen in, in some of the, the policy documents we've reviewed or we've, we've helped construct is what we mean when we say AI. Uh, what is actually subject to this, this policy? Um, the term AI can mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people. Um, so aligning on what that means for a company within the context of a policy is important. What is going to be subject to it? Um, Policy documents are also uh, really interesting vehicles for forcing alignment around complex topics, which is one reason why certain organizations will push a lot of policies. Um, it, it, the second that you start to say something is going to be required, everybody comes out of the woodwork with opinions. So it's a, this is both a good thing and a bad thing. Uh, a good thing in that feedback is incredibly important. It helps establish a baseline. Um, but it, it also can be challenging in that you can't possibly satisfy tons of different people's perspectives. So how do you, again, agree on someone who makes an ultimate decision for how we move forward? Um, and partly policies are, uh, they're driven through leadership types of structures, which uh, provide that kind of executive sponsorship glow to it, uh, which also helps um, gain gain alignment pretty quickly around what, what is um, it, what we should be considering in a specific policy or not. Um, and it's very unlikely that there's going to be one policy to rule them all within a specific company or across all companies. Um, more likely they'll be because the, the use of AI is so broad 
across the company. Um, they might be more specific to individual use cases or types of models or um, considerations around how certain uh, how certain data can be or cannot be used for certain types of systems. They might relate to a specific type of a regulatory initiative or they might be wholly independent driven by ethics. So um, you know, pretty, pretty flexible mechanisms that companies are, are starting to adopt. Uh, I think my big, my big thing for technical teams is uh, we need to find ways to get involved with policymaking with inside, with inside the organizations that we're part of. Otherwise, um, likely those policies might miss the bill on, on what we, we actually do. So something for us to, to take away and consider. Um, Policy-led approaches obviously are not perfect. I, we've outlined a few of them. Um, I think the biggest critique that they receive is that they still sometimes don't feel um, specific enough. They don't really provide us with as much tactical guidance. Again, as technical teams, like we just want to know a test to do. We just want to know what um, you know how to get the the green check mark in our in our unit tests. So we just want to understand what the requirements are that we need to design around. Uh, policies are not necessarily going to be the only way to, to provide that. In fact, it's typically designed so that the teams that are um, subject to those policies can create their own practices to align to it at a high level. Uh, that's intentional. Uh, if you think about all the different teams that might be building AI systems within a specific company, they might have extremely different ways of operating. Uh, you could have a company that has a product team that's developing capabilities specifically for customers. That same company might have um, an IT back office team that's building AI machine learning systems to process invoices. Um, you might have a fraud team that's trying to identify um, uh, anomalies in transactions or, or patterns of behavior from the, from the user base so that they can improve the overall um, user experience and, and any number of other activities. Those are all very different types of systems that are, are likely designed and governed very differently because of the way those companies have historically operated and, and how those systems need to be effectuated. So one policy will be very, very hard to attach to all of those. Um, I think one of the other challenges I, I, I think is important to float is that sometimes policies are, are an immediate reaction to a specific type of a regulation which makes them feel extremely specific. So they might miss the, the forest for the trees by focusing on a very, very, very narrow topic and not thinking about the generalizability of that to other related spaces. Um, so like for example, I've, I had someone approach me a little while ago asking me for a policy, what a policy around GPT-3 could look like. Uh, for those of you not familiar, GPT-3 is a generative model for text. And um, if, if you create a policy around GPT, GPT-3 specifically, you miss all of the other generative types of models. They also don't think about what a good use case is for a generative model within an organization uh, and where do you draw the line there. So that's that's a, a type of attention that can emerge here. So policy-led is very important, doesn't work for everybody, um, is necessary at some point in time. So moving on into practice and technology-led. So again, this is bottom up. This is a completely different perspective. Um, and again, this type of a, a bottom up type of a view sometimes originates from, from a few different spaces. It could come from, hey, there's this really cool tool and it'll help us assess for bias. Um, or it could be, hey, we're adopting a, um, a whole platform for our uh, model deployment within our specific team and it has this really great capability to help us inventory and, and, and standardize on tests. Um, or it might just be a recognition from the team building themselves that, that they want to standardize on um, how they develop so that there is consistency across their entire suite. And that could be formally through um, specific types of required practices, or it could be informally through peer reviews and other types of, of uh, checkpoints that might be instituted. Um, I want to go back to that nine-step development process that we had, if you remember, in that middle bucket. In, in what sometimes we refer to as the tube map because it kind of looks like a London tube system. Uh, and these nine steps, while I mentioned they are iterative, when you think about them from a linear perspective, uh, they have fairly natural um, components in them where if we do those effectively, we're instituting appropriate governance from a first line perspective. Uh, so aligning on what a 
good use cases for a machine learning system, what the requirements actually are for that system, how we know what good looks like. And, and good can mean a lot of different things. It could be, I know my model is performant enough when I achieve this threshold. It could be that um, my model needs to be uh, sufficiently understandable by this type of an audience. It could be that I don't have enough information, so this needs to be something that is designed to learn over time. But understanding from the very beginning, what are we trying to build? What are the requirements of that? Uh, what are we trying to get to from this whole development exercise? And that, that requires close alignment with business teams. Then we get into this process of actually um, working with the data, manipulating it, um, assessing what we can and can't do there, uh, building a model, building different types of, of, of machine learning systems and comparing them against one another and coming up with a final um, final initial model, which is at step five. Um, from there, it's sanity check. Do we actually achieve those requirements we established forward? Is this an exercise that's worth continuing? Then we get to all of the um, deployment exercises. It's scaling and stress testing the model. Um, it might have some type of uh, uh, end user engagement or UAT testing to evaluate if that model works for the intended users, what their feedback is, um, and then ultimately to deploy that model for our limited production. Uh, if it works in production for that limited use, then we might transition that as business as usual uh, with the appropriate type of training and onboarding that would be required to get people to use it effectively. And then uh, thinking about how we might monitor that system in the long run. Again, going back to our success criteria, what does good look like in a long-term basis? Do we have a good way of measuring that? Um, and then if it no longer performs as we expected to, should we take it down? Is it something that can be fixed by retraining or, or some other type of re-architecting or do we need to decommission it? A lot of these types of activities are primarily practice-led, um, aligning on what this nine-step process looks like for a specific business unit for a specific data science team, um, having opportunities to check and challenge one another it might not be quite as formalized throughout these five stage gates that I have here. It could be a little bit less formal, but still having some type of standard process that we can keep ourselves accountable to. The institutionalization of that can then be escalated up throughout the organization. And some of these stage gates might actually be very important to those second line teams, our compliance teams, if they're interested in the models we're building, the data we're using, so on and so forth. So it has a benefit outside of just the team. But immediately within the group, it's like, how do we use these tools at our disposal um, for testing? How do we think about standard testing? Is there anything that we, we feel like we could be driving um, to institute common practice? I will say it's inspiring when teams start to drive alignment like this on their own without pressure from a compliance org, because it, it also helps us understand what one another are actually working on, and we can share ideas a lot more effectively through this type of a model. Um, I really love the peer review model. I think it's it's something that can work really well. Um, it's also a great opportunity to talk to people about the stuff that you're doing um, and get feedback from people who might not be as closely involved, but might have a good, um, good perspective from a, an objective third party point of view. Um, like I mentioned, there are a lot of different activities that could underpin this all throughout different types of groups, different uh, with different requirements. It, this is a, a very dense slide with a lot of these types of things. Some of them might come specifically from development teams. So if you see things like data engineers, ML architect, product owner, model ops, um, those are, are all developers. They're, they're people working in the development space, building something. Uh, the business is commissioning them. Uh, you'll notice that there are a few groups that pop up, like internal audit. Um, they they have less of a prominent role here, but really they're there to to evaluate that that the acceptance criteria that have been established are are working effectively. There are a large number of tests that organizations might adopt um, to support some of these. Documentation is also emerging as a great way to um, to support and standardize across these these nine steps. Things like documentation, risk tiering, um, uh, um, other types of, of lineage requirements, those might come from the second line, but it's, it sometimes just originates from the first line to have something effective that they can then reference. Um, and they have benefits outside of just compliance. Uh, how often is it that someone leaves the company or moves roles after they've started building something or something goes live? Um, orphaning a system is not 
fun and it's incredibly painful to try and dissect someone's code to understand what they were building. If they had appropriate documentation, it would be easier to understand what that actually was. If they actually went through specific tests we um, and that person has gone to a different role, we would still have more confidence in how that model performs in the long run. So there, there's a wide range of activities that could potentially underpin all of this. And um, you know, we're, we're seeing the machine learning teams evolving with newer types of roles and responsibilities to do this effectively. We still have our, our data scientists and data engineers. Um, those I think have been around for many years now within a lot of companies or a lot of data science type of groups. Uh, they've historically been focused on, hey, I have a cool problem and I have a bunch of data, what can I do with it? Um, more emergent roles are focused on in a few spaces. One, um, aligning on criteria for success, that would be things like a product owner. It could be the productionalization of that system. So that would be um, the ML architect and ML engineer. That would be focused on specifically uh, scoping a sustainable solution and then working on the software components to implement that model in practice. Um, and then ML ops focusing on the post deployment pieces of that. I think there's probably a role or two missing here that might exist within some companies like a strategist or um, even an analyst type of a role, someone that's um, meant to interface with, with the, the business and try and capture requirements in a different way. Um, some organizations even have uh, like completely different organizational models where some of these people fit in bits and pieces and I'll, we'll walk through that on the next page. But I think the big piece here is that if we build models for one-time inference or for one-time use, they really don't have um, a lot of longevity. Um, and if we don't build models that are intended to be there for a long time, uh, we don't necessarily have the practices to keep them evergreen um, or working well under a variety of conditions. Effect, uh, and again, effective first-line governance really needs to mitigate that um, by having some of these types of roles and new types of capabilities. And each of these different people are involved in different parts of that nine-step process, as I mentioned. Uh, product owner should over, oversee everything. An ML architect is there at the beginning because they're trying to scope the appropriate type of solution. Um, data engineer also at the beginning while we're working on data components. A data scientist is involved with the primarily, primary model uh, building processes and data exploration pieces. ML engineer and ML ops are at the very end. Um, they're there to make sure that the model is, is sustainable in the long run. Uh, Ilana, I'm uh, so sorry to interrupt you, but we need to finish up. Sure. I have, uh, I think, like two slides left. So again, um, practice led governance has a variety of drivers. Some of them are coming from open source spaces. Um, some of them are coming just from cloud platforms, having uh, built more built in types of capabilities around testing, uh, typically around narrow spaces. Uh, and there's a wide variety of very active community um, in the open source space that's sharing code repositories. Uh, to enable better uh, better types of testing methodologies. Uh, so that's something that we see as well. So uh, I think we talked about a lot of the risks or a lot of the challenges, but mostly it's that you can have different types of practices emerging across an organization and that can be very hard to reconcile. So uh, finding ways to align both the top down and the bottom up perspectives are, are really what we, um, what we think about. Uh, the, Organizations themselves might have different operating models where certain teams might sit in different spaces. All of that is important for us to consider as we think about how we reconcile these different um, these different types of strategies. What works in a centralized model um, won't necessarily work in a federated model where every business unit operates independently. Um, so the practices around both top down and bottom up need to take that into account. So regardless of, of where um, what, what direction companies take, and they typically do start with one. Um, it's important to think about how we get to the middle, who's going to lead these types of initiatives, um, how we, we reconcile with existing compliance work so that there's not um, overly burdensome governance, and then incrementally building some of the capabilities for companies. I apologize, the last bit of that was a little quick, and I'd love to take um, questions if there's any time remaining. Thank you everybody for joining.